uh, this is Professor Alexander Voss, and I'm very happy to have you here with me today for this special course. This one's called Witty Inventions, and the reason I brought this out is we're having tough times in the world, and I wanted to say that this is probably the best time to come up with good and new ideas. And so if you're interested in electronics, which I am, we always want to think that there's, bound, there's no boundaries ahead of us. And so consequently, I thought, well, what kind of ideas can I come with on the fringe, on like the science fiction level of what, what would happen with electronics? I want to throw these ideas out here. These are inventions that I've had for a number of years, and I thought, well, I'd document them, put them where everybody could see them, and hopefully somebody could develop them. I mean, I want to, I tried to patent a few. The patent process is very difficult. But I wanted to bring it out here, get it on videotape, and give everybody some ideas and stuff to talk about. Uh, I'm interested in developing these ideas, but I wanted to have them for everyone to talk about and to think about and so forth. I've had several inventions that I've come up with that I don't know if they work or not, but I want to put the idea out there. And uh, I have one that I've done that uh, has worked, but it's uh, been a very difficult uh, patent process because people don't like to uh, use anything that will change the status quo. The first one that I uh, patented a number of years ago was for the television uh, system. And when we came out with digital television, uh, it made this possible. And I call this commercial eliminator. Now, the commercial eliminator. I had it in the patent process, and, it, and actually I made a working prototype that worked. Now what happens is when you look at television, uh, you have to realize that now it's all digital. And what we do is if you look at a data stream, let's say that we have a television signal, and it's converted into a data stream, which is basically, um, you know, ones and zeros. And I came up with a method and tested it and it worked in a computer simulation where uh, if you're familiar with eliminating viruses from a computer, what happens if you get a virus on your computer, you have a, uh, a, a protocol where you actually have virus files that you look at the virus file and you say, okay, this file matches up with this file or this data matches up with this data and so it's the same thing. So let's say I have a stream of, of digital television after it's decoded. And there's many methods to do this, but I'm just going to give you the idea. Let's say this section from here to here represents a commercial, a television commercial you don't want to watch. And let's say that I have a definition file in my computer that, rec that will have this exact same data in this area, and then it will match it up with a definition file that's downloaded into the computer to tell it that this is so this that, that this is a commercial and so what happens is this data and this data match perfectly and when it recognizes the matching data it knows to cut that out because that would be as effectively considered a virus in the system and then we would splice the next data together with this, making a continuous stream of your video. And it, that would be true for every commercial in the system. It has a definition of what the commercial is. It then will remove it, splice the video that happened after the commercial together. You start watching like five minutes late. You can watch the whole show all the way through without interruption. Also, there's a whole lot of markers they came up with, not just the video, but the audio. I could compare the audio files and use that for a reference. I could compare the uh, closed caption information. I could compare all kinds of data that exists in that video stream and use that as markers to eliminate the unwanted commercial. I've done this in a computer. It works, but and patented it, but everybody was afraid to touch it. And I uh, came up with about 15 different parameters that I could use to identify a commercial and eliminate it. And it might, you know, it might recognize this bit of data right in here of the commercial, but it knows that this bit of data is this much in time ahead of this point. And so it can be, you can actually know the cut back at this point and do your insertion. That's the first thing. 
Um, yeah, that worked at a computer simulation, but people were sort of afraid to touch it when I started trying to patent it. Um, and now we're going to get into something a little more interesting. Um, this is something I thought, well, could we do this? Is this possible? And I called it laser heterodyning. Now, heterodyning is a process that's been used in radio reception for years. It's been used in radio reception for years. And what that process is, if I have a signal coming in, which is received, here's an antenna, and it's been detected, and uh, well, no, this is before detection, and I have a, an AM or FM radio signal, and then I have an oscillator. And what happens is this oscillator will put out another sine wave that is of a specific frequency, okay? Now we take these two signals and we combine them in a heterodyning process. And when you heterodyne the two, fundament two fundamental signals, the resultant output is the, well, let's call this one, two, fundamental one, fundamental two. You get one and two out, and, but you also get a frequency which is equivalent to one minus two and one plus two. So you'll have a higher frequency, which is addition of these two, and you'll have a lower frequency, which is a subtraction of those two. Now, and what happens is in, in radio receivers, we uh, take this oscillator and we vary its frequency. And we take the subtractive frequency and then we have an output which is then fed to the detector which gives us the desired channel. Major Armstrong invented this back in the 1930s. It was called the superheterodyne radio receiver. And so what happens is vary the frequency of this oscillator heterodyning with the incoming signal, and then that will make a subtractive signal in the heterodyning process that produces your desired signal that you want to be decoded or detected and then uh, received by your radio receiver. So it's changing this oscillator that tunes your channels. Well, let's apply that to a whole new idea. Um, Let's say I have a laser, okay, and I have another one here. I'm drawing that real sloppy. Okay, and let's say that laser, this laser is emitting a beam of laser light and this laser is emitting a beam of laser light that are meeting at a point in space. Let's say this one is an ultraviolet frequency of light. Let's say this is also an ultraviolet frequency of light. Okay? The UV here is a higher frequency than the human eye can see. The UV here is a higher frequency than the human eye can see. But at the point where those two lights, uh, laser beams meet in space, and you may have to have some sort of media that will help the heterodyning process, but you can vary the frequency of ultraviolet here or here. And when you combine these two points of light here, these two frequencies, then you're going to have a heterodyning effect. I don't know if this works, but it's a nifty idea if it does. And so at that point, we're going to have the same thing. We're going to have the higher, the uh, UV1 and UV2, and then the lower. Well, the lower is going to be down in the frequency in the visible spectrum. So this lower frequency combined with this heterodyning going here with these two lasers is going to make a point of light in space that just appears in space. And you vary either one of these frequencies 
and the heterodyning is going to produce a higher or lower frequency, which means this, low, this point of light can be any, any color. You can vary the intensity of these two lasers, and it can be any brightness. So you created a point of light in space that can be any color and any intensity. Let's say we decide we want to scan these lasers in a cube. You know, we've got them scanning back and forth, one scanning like this, one scanning like this. That means you have a, a 3D area in space where you created pixels that can be any color and any intensity. The first real 3D video system, if this works. I don't know if you have to make a special media to create the heterodyning. I don't know what happens in space. I used to work with lasers, and I did notice when you made two laser beams hit one another, you would have this effect. I don't know if it's possible to make it work, but it sure is an nifty idea. Okay? That's part of my witty invention series. Maybe someone can do something with this. I want to reserve the right to this idea, but it takes a lot of people to develop a good idea. <clears throat> and that's sort of far-fetched. Okay, let's take a... I'm really, go, I'm really wanting to go to the extreme today <clears throat> of ideas, whether they work or not. I came up with this idea years ago. I call it a water burner. Now, this, if it works, is a great idea. I'm surprised that no one's done it yet, but I'd certainly like to see it developed. But here's an idea. May not work, may never work. Here's an idea. Let's say we have a basin of water, okay? And then we'll have a tube coming out of that basin. Now, what we're doing with this water here, and of course I'll put a better drawing in, um, in the video, <clears throat> we're going to evaporate this water. We can either use that spinning evaporator like they used to use, where you'd actually take a Venturi effect, you'd take the water and spin it, and it would hit teeth, and it would turn into a vapor. Or you could use an ultrasonic water vaporizer. You could boil it. You could actually use a, a wick filtration or whatever would work to make a stream of small particle water vapor. You may have to use ultrasonic to get the water vapor, vapor small enough. Okay, let's say we, we take that water vapor up and it's coming up. Now, probably we'd need some sort of blower that would force the air up a little more. Now, here's where it gets interesting. I'm going to put a chamber here where the water vapor is going through. Okay? And I'm going to put in this chamber a microwave transmitter. Now, as this water vapor is going through this chamber, which is sealed for the microwave signal to come through, let's just say that this signal that is coming out of this microwave transmitter is at a frequency of the atoms that, com that work with water, hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen has a resonant frequency or has a natural frequency of 21, around 21 centimeters. Both oxygen and hydrogen have a resonant frequency. If I put out a microwave signal into this area, and it could be modulated, like make a square wave, make a triangular wave, make a spike or something, that would agitate violently the at atomic components or subatomic components of, of water, and if you agitate it enough, you could split that bonding and separate the hydrogen from the oxygen from this microwave signal hitting those water molecules in that, in that steam 
are in that water vapor going through this chamber. So once those are separated by this microwave signal, <clears throat> then what we have is we have a gas consisting of oxygen and hydrogen separated coming out of this point right here. And I could put an igniter here and I could actually light that and it would make a flame. I could take this and then feed it to some sort of internal combustion engine internal combustion engine which would then turn a generator which would then make a voltage that would supply this microwave leaving extra power to be taken off and used to run other things. I could not use an internal combustion engine. I could use a steam driven engine. Anything that you can take heat and make into a uh, uh, you know mechanical force, you could then complete this cycle. You know, even take some power off here and run the blower, and some power off here and run the thing that's making it uh, into a water vapor, and you have a system for making energy from water. That's a little far-fetched, nifty idea. <clears throat> it seems to me that the right microwave signal coming into this water vapor if it had sufficient force would cause the molecules to split if one molecule is forced to vibrate or move at a frequency. I'm, some people even talked about using sound for this. I've been uh, one time thought about using sound instead of microwave. I thought microwave would work better. Where you could separate these molecules either using microwave or sound. And once they're separated, then they're ignitable. Then you can turn them into an energy source. Okay? Witty ideas, witty inventions may never work, but I certainly want to reserve my rights to this, but I think it's going to take other people to make it work. Wanted to put that out there just for the sake of it being there. <clears throat> but it's still food for thought. And this is what it's about, is imagination. You know. You have to have imagination. If none of this ever works, it, it doesn't matter because we had the imagination to come up with it. Someday, sometime, someone imagines something and it becomes an invention that helps people. Another one I came up with was the um, was a USB key. Now, if you're familiar with a USB jump drive, which most people are, imagine another purpose for that. Imagine you put that USB jump drive and instead of using a key to go in your house, you put the jump drive into your front door and that acts as a key. And when, the, when it sees that jump drive that has your code in it, it opens the door or starts your car. It could be for your car. But in this case, you can download information too or upload information to the jump drive. You can always change your code in this. You can change your code. Instead of having to go have a key made, you just change the code using your computer. So if you ever want to change your locks, just plug it into your computer, change the code, download it into the lock, you've changed your locks. Or let's say that we uh, want to start our car. It does the same thing. Maybe the car has some diagnostic information that it wants to give you. You could upload diagnostic information and it would tell you the status of the car when you plug this into your computer. Or let's say that we wanted to know who was opening the house last or who drove the car last. You know. And this is a neat idea. Just take your little USB jump drive, plug it in your computer, plug it into your door lock, plug it into your car. And that's it for witty inventions. I appreciate you taking time to listen to this. Thank you.